Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to D-Day. <clears throat> I see people coming on. Hi, Sue Klein. Nice to see you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to D-Day on this Monday night. I'm so happy to see you. I see the numbers popping up as people are coming on. So we'll give people a few minutes to come on. Hi, Mom. So happy you're here. Hi, Gail. Nice to see you. Well, at least to see your name pop up. <laughs> Welcome to D-Day. If you this is your first time here, please say hi to us in the chat. Just say, hey, I'm here, Steph. Nice to see you. Hi. And then that way I can say hi to you. So otherwise, you can see me, but I cannot see you. But I am so thrilled to have you all here tonight as we continue on in our journey through James. We'll give a few people, uh, we'll give a few minutes for people to come on because I know people take a few minutes to get on. So we don't want to start until we have everyone with us. So welcome to D-Day. You can hit the like and the love emoji as much, much as you possibly want. You can share this video. You can email it to your friends and say, hi, Brooke. Well, don't email your friends and say, hi, Brooke. That's, <laughs> that's me saying hi to Brooke because she just popped on. Email your friends and say, hey, here's a great video for you to watch. It'll be encouraging for you. So here you go. And email it to your friend. Uh, so help us partner with us and share your video. We have people watching on Facebook. We have people watching on LinkedIn. And we have people watching on YouTube. Now, so that you are all aware, we... Uh, so if Sue Klein, or sorry, Sue Campbell and Sue Klein over here and Gail, they're all wonderful uh, chatters and they kind of monitor what's going on over there in the chat section. But here's the problem. If you're on a different venue than Facebook, then they can't see you or whoever's facilitating can't see you, only I can. So please forgive us if you come on from YouTube and you come on from LinkedIn and we don't immediately say hi to you because it takes a minute for me to see you pop up and only I can say hi to you because I, only I can see you pop up. Anyway, enough, Steph's babbling. <laughs> Hi, everyone. How are you all tonight on this Monday night on a scale from 1 to 10? 1 being eh and 10 being marvelous. Where are you on the scale of meter for where, what kind of a week you had last week from last Monday to this Monday? So 1 being rotten and 10 being wonderful. Where are you on that scale? Hi, Sonia. So nice to see you. Hi. Welcome. Oh, I see a few tens. I see a five. Yeah. Oh, I see some sevens. Yeah, kind of in the middle there. Uh, oh, some eights. Well, it looks like most of you had a pretty good week so far. Well, from last Monday to this Monday. Yeah. Anyway, Sue uh, Campbell, who's our facilitator, she is just having some issues. Hang on one second. Anyway, sorry about that. Sue uh, Campbell's having some issues coming on, so she's on now. So sorry, one of the things about being online is sometimes there are behind the scene issues and I'm trying to manage those as well. So it's like, oh my gosh, you're doing five things at once. So I think she should be on soon. Hi, Nina, it's so good to see you. And you're in Halifax, oh my goodness. You must be dog sitting. <laughs> 
So, so I'm going to give you a hug. Here's a hug for everyone. So glad you guys are all online tonight and, and to join me on this journey. We'll just give Sue a few minutes. So hopefully we'll see her pop up here in a minute. So I know she's, oh, there she is. She's on. So great. We have Sue on. Great. For all of you on LinkedIn and uh, YouTube, welcome. We're glad you're here as well tonight. For those of you who are on and you don't want to join into the chat section, hey, that's okay. Uh, introverts, you're fine. If you just want to sit and listen, that's awesome. If you want to participate, you can in the chat section, all you extroverts, if you want to. And build, it builds community over there. I will highly recommend that if you are just listening to the video, please read through the comments because there's a lot of wisdom over there as well. We all, we teach each other. And so, Go back and read the comments to the video and feel free to comment on the videos afterwards because I look through them. And if there's something, if you have a question and maybe at the end, I usually try to give you some questions. But if, lately, if I've been going over time, I haven't really been doing that. But I will give you a chance to ask some questions. So if you have any questions that you are, have had on your mind, make sure you keep a list of them because at one point or other, I'm going to ask you, give you a chance. Because normally at D-Day, I try to do that at the end of every session. But if we've over, if we've overshot our time, then I just let you go. But we want you to understand what you're being taught. Hi, Wendy. So happy you're here. Welcome. Welcome. And that's one of the things about D-Day is that we want this to be a place, a community. We want it to be a place of learning. This is not a place for you to come on and listen to Steph Robbins talk. <laughs> because if that's what it is, uh, well, there's no sense of us being here. But if we're here because we are seekers of what God wants to teach us through his word, if we want to open God's word together and we want to be fed by sitting at his feet, then we're in the right place together. And on that note, I would have to say happy birthday to Wendy, who is in the chat section. Everybody over there, today is Wendy's birthday. Please wish Wendy a happy birthday over there because it's her birthday today. And we can't let people's birthdays go unnoticed if we know here at D-Day. So happy birthday, Wendy. I, I would sing happy birthday to you, but I would like for people to stay on. So I'm not going to sing. <laughs> we will just wish you happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so good. Everybody's wishing her happy birthday. Yay. So for those of you who are new to D-Day and we're on here together, we're walking through the book of James and we're journeying through the book of James. We are taking the slow boat through the book of James and believe you me, we are doing in depth, but it could be even more in depth because this book is small, but it is very, very meaty. And there is a lot of practical theology in it. And what I mean by practical theology is it's our it's theology that we walk out every day. It is theology that we uh, we we live out in our daily lives. It's how we display Christ in them. And James is a rubber meets the road type of guy in his in this letter, in this epistle, and we are getting some very practical boots to the ground theology here. And it's been a wonderful book so far. And I'm, I know that it has been a blessing probably for many of you and an encouragement. It has also been, um, and I'm sure we've also felt the conviction, right, of the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing about conviction. Conviction is a gift, my friend. And I don't know if I've said this on D-Day before or not, but conviction is a gift, my friend. That is how the Holy Spirit lets you know that there is something off in your life that needs some attention when you have that quickening of the Holy Spirit's conviction or when you feel that, 
you know, sense in your stomach and we all feel it in a different way, but that is, it's not condemnation. Okay. Condemnation and conviction are two very different things. Conviction is about your behavior. Condemnation is about who you are as a person. Condemnation is death. Conviction leads to life. Condemnation comes from the devil. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. Do not be afraid of conviction. And if you feel it, and sometimes we know it because we get angry, and that's a sure sign that we're convicted, we need to understand how we respond to the Holy Spirit's conviction. And, and sometimes we do get angry because we don't want to hear the truth. And so when we hear it, we get angry. But then we have to process it and say, okay, what's going on here? What is fueling this anger? Because normally anger doesn't come from a good place most times. So we have, James has already talked to us about that. So that's just a quick lesson about conviction and condemnation because I'm thinking, I'm thinking tonight <laughs> we might be feeling some conviction because James is going to tackle a subject tonight that I'm sure every one of us, every one of us are going to say, this is the marker. This is the pointer of progress that I struggle with the most is number six. When I tell you what it is, we're all going to feel some conviction tonight because I can tell you, Steph felt some conviction in preparation for this. Uh, Steph felt a lot of conviction for this prep, for this sermon, and for this lesson. So tonight, I wanted to tell you the difference in case you need to understand what that means and why conviction is a good thing, because it's the Holy Spirit telling us something needs to be addressed in our spiritual life. And of course, our natural self does not want to do that because our natural self thinks we're perfect and we have it all together. And our pride doesn't want us to admit that maybe a decision we made or a situation in our life that appears good isn't really. And we don't really want to see it. So we kind of brush off the conviction. But tonight, it's very important that we understand the difference. So... Uh, tonight, we're going to jump into chapter three. We are moving into James chapter three for the next two weeks. Last week, we looked at a Christian in his works. This week, we're going to be looking at a Christian in his words. And after Easter break, we're going to be looking at a Christian and his wisdom. Right? A Christian and his wisdom. So to date, we've moved through five of the pointers of progress or the markers of maturity that James has laid out in this epistle. And again, we're going to go through them because, you know, repetition is a way we learn. So get your fingers ready because I'm going to ask you what they are. So what is the first marker of maturity or the first pointer of progress that we've learned? And I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with testing. You can answer it in the chat section. What's the first pointer of progress or the marker of maturity that James teaches us? God tests us to grow taller. That's right, Sue. That's right, Sue Klein. We grow through our testing. Right. Testing helps us to grow. Right. You guys are right. What's number two? What's marker number two that James taught? Our growth is stunted by sin. Right. Growth is stunted by sin. That's right. Man, you guys are some good students over there. You all get a gold star. What's the third one? So what's the third marker? So far we know the first marker is when we get to the point where we understand that our that testing is used to grow us, right? That's a marker of maturity. When we understand that sin stunts our growth and we learn to handle sin and we learn to handle temptation quickly, right? The third one is, what is the third one? 
we grow right we grow when we are hungry for the word we grow when we eat the bread of god's word that's right we grow when we are in god's word on a consistent regular basis <laughs> wendy just said if we were doing jeopardy right now we'd all be winning and that's right you all would be winning <laughs> So, okay, so that's three. We grow through testing. We grow when we understand that we are our growth is stunted by sin and temptation. We grow when we are regularly partaking of God's word and we're in God's word. What is the third marker? This one has to do with people. That's right. Maturity shows when we can love the unlovable. It's when when we don't when we don't treat people with partiality, right? So that's number 4. Number 5 is What's the five the fifth marker we talked about it last week? The fifth marker we talked about last week. So while you're thinking about it, I'll repeat them. We grow through testing. So the, our pointers of progress or our markers of maturity are when we recognize that our when we go through testing, that is to help us to grow. It is not. It's to make us better, not bitter. We grow when we understand that we are to shun sin because it stunts our growth and we need to handle sin and temptation as soon as the, as the Holy Spirit points it out. Number three, we are able to love the unlovely. Number four, we are constantly and consistently in God's word and we know that that is necessity, that is a necessity for us to grow. And number five, that faith without works is dead. That's right. Our, we don't work for our salvation, but we work out of our salvation. And as we said last night, we don't work for God's approval because we already have that through salvation. We do outward deeds because there's no way that a real genuine faith can be hidden. It has to be seen. Why does it have to be seen? It doesn't need to be seen by God. It needs to be seen by mankind. Because without them, there's no testimony that you actually have a faith. So that's, that's number five. And so we're moving on to number six. And this one is a big one number six is the marker of maturity is so brace yourself because here it comes here it comes here's the tough one uh the marker of maturity or the six pointer of progress is when i seek to control my tongue and everybody says a holy ouch Because I'm pretty sure that if I asked you to give me a raise of hands, how many of you would say, man, I struggle with my tongue. We would all have to raise our hand because I do not think that there are too many people who have nailed this one. Right? We might, we might know that we can, we know that, Testing is for our growth, so we're not bitter about those. We might understand that sin stumps my growth, and temptation does too, so I need to deal with them right away. We also understand that we need to be in God's word, and we are consistently trying to do that. We can understand that we need to love the unlovely, and we don't treat people with, with partiality. We love people, and we don't, and we make sure that our faith is seen. Right. We we know that we are put here to display Christ and Christ did good deeds while he was on earth. So same thing with us. We work out of that to display him. But this one here, this one here, we might have the other three out of the five already nailed down. But this one. I'm thinking this one is the one where we're all going to be like, yeah. So let's let's stop. 
and take some time to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, to be our guide. And then we're going to join hands. <laughs> Not really, but virtually we're going to hang on to each other's hands and we're going to come to the word of God and we're going to look into it at the mirror of his words. And we are going to understand what he has to say for us tonight. And we are going to be open we are going to be open to what the Holy Spirit has to say to us because, my friends, this one, this one, this is where we all struggle. And there's no sense in any of us saying that this is something that I have absolutely under control. So let's come to the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. And let's jump into God's, God's word. Then we're going to join each other. We're going to virtually hang on to each other's hands. And we're going to come before God. And we're going to ask him to show us and teach us. So let's pray. Almighty God, we know that scripture tells us that there is not a hair on our head that you have not numbered. Scripture tells us that you knew us before we were even conceived in our mother's womb. You, Abba, Father, you are the, you are the great I am. You are the God that spoke this world into existence. And you know every one of us here intimately. There is not one person on this uh, video tonight that hasn't been called here by you and there is not one person online watching this video now or later that you do not love that you do not adore even though we are flawed and messy and tend to be stubborn and self-righteous and we come before you and we ask you to forgive us Forgive us for our sins as we are coming into this holy of holy weeks. I pray that you'd help us to not be pretenders, but now help us to come to your word earnestly willing to see what we need to see so that we can be the people we ought to be in the light of the events that are going to happen or that happened or that we are going to celebrate that happened at the end of this week. May we be men and women of the cross. So Holy Spirit, we invite you here. Oh, Holy Spirit, we know that you're probably going to be busy tonight talking to us all. But we ask for that. We long for that. We want that. Because we know our Lord and Savior did not go through all of the agony that he went through this week so that I could be a pretender or so that I could just get a free ticket to heaven, but that I can pick up my cross and follow him. And for some of us, our cross is our tongue and the control of it. So please help us tonight to hear you and not just be hearers though, but also to be doers. So forgive us our sins. Help us to come before you with listening hearts and open ears so that we can hear. And may the word fall on good soil. And I ask that you would not let the devil to steal it away by our own objections and rationale afterwards. I ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we're going to move on into James chapter 3 tonight. And throughout the book of James, there's a probing question. There's a probing question that holds the whole theme of this book together. And it was one, it was put forth by Chuck Swindoll in one of his books. And it, I thought it was really great. So the question is this. This is one of the, this is the question that puts the whole theme of James into context. If you say you believe like you should, why do you behave like you shouldn't? If you say you believe like you should, why do you behave like you shouldn't? 
And that's been one of the questions that we you can see where it fits into chapter one and chapter two. In James 3, 1 to 12, which is what we're going to cover tonight, James 3, 1 to 12, he develops that question and that theme in a specific direction. And that is about controlling the tongue. There is no other section. There's no other section of the Bible that speaks with greater clarity and more impact on the potential destructive power of our words than James chapter 3, 1 to 12. So tonight, as we're going through, we're thinking about the question that I just said. If you say you believe like you should, why do you behave like you shouldn't? So tonight, the question I want you to keep in mind, and you can even write this down on your paper. If you're taking notes right now, write this question down at the top of your paper. It said, this is the question. If you say you believe like you should, why do you say things you shouldn't? Let me repeat that. If you say you believe like you should, why do you say things you shouldn't? How many of us can testify to a time when our words, when our words caused havoc? When how many times can we all raise our hand and say there's countless times I wish I hadn't said that? I spoke at a turn. I spoke in anger. Uh, or we've been hurt by someone else's words. Someone once said, there's been more people destroyed by the tongue than by the sword. And as Nina said over there, a tongue has no bones, but it's strong enough to break a heart. There's so much we could talk about tonight and we don't have a whole lot of time, but we are going to jump into this as best as we possibly can. But this is a question I'm wanting to keep in mind. If you say you believe like you should, why do you say things you, should, you shouldn't? So we're going to read James 3 verses 1 to 12, and then we're going to go back and walk through them. Okay. So I, I am sure, like I said, we can all, we have all either been the person that caused harm or we have felt harm from somebody else. And I'm sure as we walk through this tonight, we are going to recall, we're going to come to mind many things as we go through this. But let's read God's word first. James 3, we're going to read verses 1 to 12. So if you have your Bibles, please open them and read them with me. Uh, maybe you want to just listen. If you want to listen to me, read them. Close your eyes and listen to God's word so that you're listening to it, right? Try not to be distracted by what's going on around you, but just try to hone in for a moment and listen to God's word as I read it. So James 3, 1 to 12. My brethren, so note, we're talking to Christians again. Let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to, bri to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. 
but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men. We have been made, who have been made in the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grape vine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. And we thank God for the reading of his word. Now we're going to go back and walk through this very, very descriptive passage. And if you notice, James likes to ask questions to emphasize his point. So we're going to walk through this. James has some very telling things, right? In James chapter 2, the question is, do my works match my words? Sorry, my light is just falling down here. Do my work do my works match my words? Do my works match my words, right? And in James chapter 3, the question is, do your words match your words? Right? Just hang on a second, sorry. Hopefully that stays. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. So, again, so James chapter 2, the question is, does your work match your words? And then James chapter 3, the question is, does your words match your words? Right? Do your words match your words? A Greek philosopher asked his servant to provide the best possible meal. He was having some guests over, and he... Um, he wanted to have the best possible meal. And he told his servant, who happened to be Asap, if you are familiar with Asap Fables, it's the same one. He, his master said, I want you to, prefer, to, to present the most succulent thing on this earth. Like, no, money is, no, is not to be a concern. Just go prepare the best meal that money can buy. The best thing that money can buy for food. Well, he went and he prepared a dish. And it was a dish of tongues. And he prepared tongues in every different sauce, every different way you could possibly prepare it. He did it. So the first course came out and all the guests laughed. The second course came out and it was tongues again. And everybody was like, okay. And then the third one. It was tongues again, and everybody was like, okay. And his master was getting a little little ticked off, and he was like, what is this? I told you to prepare uh, the best possible dish. And Asap said, it is the best of all dishes, because with it, we may bless and communicate happiness. We dispel sorrow. We remove despair. We cheer the faint-hearted. We inspire the courage. Yeah, the discourage we can uh, bring wars to an end we can bring wonderful contracts to the beginning and marriages together and we can say a hundred a hundred things that are uplifting to mankind well his master thought okay well that's pretty creative and pretty good i think that's a good deal so a couple of days later the master did the same thing and this time he told asap to prepare the worst possible meal ever whatever it could be the worst dish of which he could think well you guessed it asap prepared tongue again and it was every course again and if and his master this time was really angry he was like what is going on here i get the whole thing about the tongue being good but i don't get the thing about the tongue being the worst possible dish ever and asap said it is the worst possible dish because with it we may curse and break human hearts. 
We can destroy reputations. We can promote discord and strife. We can set families and communities on fire and nations at war with one simple word. It is the worst dish possible, and it is also the, could be the best dish possible. When you think about that for a moment, isn't that a very true story if we think about our tongue? There is positivity in words, and there are negativity, negative things that we can do with our words. There are positive things we can do with our words, and there are negative things that we can do with our words. And James starts right off. He starts right out of the very beginning. And he says, what does the first thing he say? My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing we shall receive a strict, a stricter judgment. And you're thinking, well, that just comes right out of left field. And it really doesn't. It really doesn't. So hang on with me. And we are going to bring this all together as we talk through this tonight. Why does James start off with such a warning? Why do you think James starts off with such a warning to teachers? Why do you think? Why do you think James starts off with such a severe warning to teachers? Okay, let me ask you this. What is, what is the tool of a teacher? Right? What's my tool as a teacher? My tongue, right? My tongue is my tool. I better know how to wield that with maturity if God has called me to teach. Now, we're going to talk about this for a little bit because this is the most bizarre of paradoxes right here. Because every teacher who seeks to explain this passage is in a sense, is in a sense, is potentially condemning himself, right? Because this is a very heavy thing. I take this with serious responsibility, right? Because what I do has influence. What I teach has influence. My words carry. If I am speaking heresy, if I am speaking falsely as a teacher, I am held accountable to that. As a teacher, you are held to a higher count accountability than anyone else because your influence is further reaching. Because with that heavily mantle of leadership, there is a heavy mantle of responsibility and accountability. Your words and your life need to line up with what you're saying because you are an example. Right? The more knowledge you have, the more you will use your tongue. And for the most part, to share your message with others. And that's what teachers do. Right? So I'm going to try to tread lightly here on this passage, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to direct me. I do this all the time because I always think of James 3, 1, every time I teach, every time I counsel someone, every time even in my casual conversations. I try to. I'm not always good at it, but I try to because I understand that I'm held to a higher accountability, right? Remember the chapter breaks did not occur in James's time. Okay, so I want you to remember that. There were no chapter breaks when James wrote this letter, when he wrote this epistle, that was added later. So we do well not to forget that James has just been explaining the difference between a faith without works and a faith that has works. Or in other words, a faith that really works. Now he seems to jump into a discussion of the tongue. But context is always important in the most accurate interpretation. The point is that the demonstration of a genuine living faith will be seen in the words that come from our mouth, ultimately, because they come from our heart, right? If our faith has been, has been a result of a changed heart, 
a new heart like Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27 says, exchange, exchange my hard heart for a new heart. If that has happened, if our heart has been circumcised, if I have truly have a genuine faith, then the words we say will reflect our new birth, showing that we are a new creature in Christ. And so James begins with teachers who major in one of the, in the use of words to carry out their art, right? And he starts here. He starts here because in James's day, teaching was held to the high extreme like jesus was given the high title of rabbi because he was a teacher in that culture teachers were held in high regard but what was going on in james's context and in his church was that there were some inexperienced people who were raising up and teaching, but they weren't teaching godly wisdom and they weren't teaching truth. We don't necessarily know what they were teaching. Maybe they were saying, hey, you know what? We need to read and we need to treat the rich with more respect. We need to give them some better places. We don't know, but something was going on within James's context that he was addressing this. There were people teaching that shouldn't have been. And James is addressing it. So he starts by issuing a very strong command because, as we know, James does not mince words, right? So he's saying, he's not just saying, my brother, let not many of you become teachers. He's saying, actually, stop, stop becoming teachers because obviously there were people in his church who had, who had taken upon themselves to start teaching others. But he doesn't stop with that strong command. He follows with a strong warning of greater accountability for teachers who should make who should make anyone considering teaching to give it some very serious thought. Because you just because you wake up one morning and decide you want to teach God's word, and I mean teaching like even as a teacher, right? Like, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking when you're teaching God's word, when you're speaking God's word, any sort of teaching that you're doing, you need to understand that with that comes a greater responsibility, especially if you're teaching God's word. And you have to give that serious thought. Why? Because you're going to see why. James is not discouraging people from becoming teachers. After all, James himself is a teacher. What is he's discussing? He's discussing in this section is that he's discouraging the tendency for those who are not qualified or gifted to rush into teaching. He is warning that we need to calculate some restraint in our speaking. But if God has called you to be a teacher, then by all means teach, because Paul tells us in Romans 12, having therefore gifts differing according to the grace given us, whether that of prophecy, prophesy according to the, the propitiation of your faith or serving, exercise that gift within the sphere of influence. Like he goes through all that in Romans chapter 12. So we know that we're supposed to exercise our gift. But what James is saying is don't be using your gift Don't be, if you're called into teaching, do not take that lightly, right? Paul has a parallel passage in, in 1 Timothy 1, 6 to 7. It says, for some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussions, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they did not understand either what they are saying or the matter, but what they make confident assertions. So James' warning is also for us to understand that if you feel called to teach, and especially if you feel the call to teach God's word, we need to take that with a serious grain of salt. It's a tool of our trade. What are my motives behind being teaching for being a teacher? Am I teaching as an act of service? Am I trying to advance my own status or my own position in the church? Am I teaching? to discharge a duty because there's nobody else to do it? 
we as Christian teachers who are called to be Christian teachers, we need to be primary models of integrity and secondary. Secondarily, we need to be instructors of content. We need to make sure our life matches up to what we teach. That is a high accountability. We can't let our, our lives can't contradict what we teach. Those who are called to a position where your responsibility to lead people to the Savior, that's your job, is to lead people to the Savior, not away from him. Right? Not away from him. When I, and this is just my personal testimony, and I'll, and I'll share it with you because I am a teacher. And when I first felt called to teach, right, I had already had an undergrad. I graduated from a, a Bible school in the U.S. I had an undergrad. I had an undergrad in counseling and, and, and in teaching and in counseling and in teaching. So I'd already been through Bible school when God called me to teach. And I had been teaching for about 10 years when some mentors came to me and said, Steph, you need to further your education. And the Holy Spirit had put a little, had a little, put a little notch in my heart because at that time there were some really well-known women speakers, right? And People were buying their books like crazy and flocking to their sessions like crazy. And, and there was no, no education whatsoever. There was no, no training whatsoever. They just had done whatever they had done. They just decided they were teachers and they were being, you know, esteemed by the culture of the day. And at that point, like I had already been developing ministries, I had a team ministry, I had a speaking ministry, but I did have an undergrad. But my mentor said to me, Steph, you need to have some letters under your name so that people understand you are not some, you are not just hanging your shingle out there. You need to make sure that what you teach is from God and you need to take this another step. And I listened to those godly mentors. And for six years, I worked on an MDiv. And I am very, very thankful. It took me two years to agree to them because I, was, I wasn't sure why I would be going back to school at this age. And, and I didn't necessarily believe them. But at that time, I started to see these well-known Christian women speakers getting themselves in trouble and people calling them out because they had no training or no seminary training whatsoever. And I did not want to be that person. So I listened to them. And that's my story. That's my testimony. I felt like where God was calling me, I needed to do this. I did not want anyone to not listen to my Lord and Savior because I was some woman who was just talking off the top of her head. I worked hard and long for my MDiv and very much learned at the feet of my Lord. And it has equipped me and it has enabled me to be a far better speaker and teacher. I do not hold that lightly. I do not hold that lightly. Every time I come before God's word, I do not do that lightly. And I think our pastors need to understand that every time they step in a pulpit. Every time. Because this goes on to say, this goes on to tell us, and I'm going to show you here. Recall that the tongue is not something new that James that has just never addressed before. He addressed it in chapter one. He is just he is just taking it up a notch and he's he's addressing specific things about the tongue. In James chapter one, he told us, you know, be what? Be swift to listen, be slow to speak and be slow to anger. So this is not something new. And he brought he brought it up in several times in James chapter one. In fact, in 
108 verses of James, 15 are devoted to the use of the tongue and the words that we speak. 15 out of the 108 verses. And if you don't think James is in agreement with Jesus, well, let's just go back and see what Jesus said to about our tongue. In James, in uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 37, let's go see what Jesus taught about our tongues. Let me just find it here. Matthew chapter 12. And in verse 36 and 37, let's just see what these words say to us. Oh, I'm sorry, it's so very hard to see in this room. The lighting is terrible. <laughs> Let me see here. A good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word man speaks, they will give account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Did you listen to that? That's James, brother Jesus, half-brother Jesus. Words are important to God. Jesus said that we will be judged by every idle word. No wonder David says in Psalm 141.3, and I think we should make this our daily prayer, set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. As a teacher, I will give an account to God for every word I've spoken, every word I've taught. That is a grave thought. Do you realize that as a Christian, you, that you will have to give an account for every word you speak? Everything you speak to your spouse, to your kids, to your neighbor. There is a study that says that no word ever spoken ever is silent because it's a vibration that is released into the air, so it just continues on and it continues on and it continues on. With that in mind, do you think that maybe it's possible that one day when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we will actually hear our own words play back? To hear every word we ever spoke? Does that create in you a sense of responsibility for your words? That maybe our prayer should be set a guard over my mouth, Lord? Keep watch over the door of my lips. Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 12, that which is spoken in secret will be spoken on the housetop. We are all going to face a record of our words. So this is why James starts with such a serious warning, starting with those to whom the responsibility falls on the greatest, teachers. Teachers. He's not discouraging us from teaching. He's discouraging us from teaching without training, without wisdom, and certainly without the power of the Holy Spirit. But then James moves on to verse 2. And verse 2 is the key verse for this chapter. For we all stumble in many things. If everyone does not stumble in words, he is a perfect man, a broad his whole tongue. We are all going to face the record of our words. This verse two gives us some hope. What James is telling us here, he gives us he gives us even greater condemnation than verse one. He's telling us here that if you are a man or a woman who by the power of the Holy Spirit can control your tongue, James says, and you're able to control your whole body and you're a mature person. Right. So, for example, if people know you as someone who 
he is able to control their tongue, then it's a foregone con conclusion that you are controlling your fleshly desires, that there's every part of your life is under control because we have a hard time handling this two ounce piece of thing between our teeth. So the verse in Psalms was 141.3. He's saying that if you can control your tongue, then that is a witness to the world that you are also being controlled by your other desires and your appetites. It is a sure sign that you are being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now, we're all thinking about this and we're thinking, man. I, I want to do this stuff. Like, I want to do this. I understand the importance of this, and I really want to, to control my tongue. But this is such a struggle for me. Well, my friend, let's get one thing clear right now. None of us can do this on our own, right? None of us. The Holy Spirit provides the discipline. The Holy Spirit provides the self-control. He places within you and I the ability to control that tongue. We can't, troll, we can't control it on our own. It's not something we can do. And how do we do that? Well, as we submit to him and allow him to throw flow through us, we become more and more able to work out James 1 instruction of being Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. See how it's all connected? Self-control proceeds out from within me. It doesn't come from me. It comes from the Holy Spirit because it is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Right? I can't produce self-control. I can only produce self-control by submitting to the Holy Spirit, who then produces that fruit in me. Let's pause here for a moment because I think there's something very crucial that James is trying to lay out here for us all believers. If you would raise your hand right now, if I said to you, is the Holy Spirit living with you, in you? Are you a Holy Spirit filled Christian? And I'm guessing every one of us would raise our hands. Right, we would all raise our hands. Because we could probably muster up our own natural ability to do all the other five. But this one here, this one here, we have to say we are not walking in maturity. Because what we are, we are reactors rather than responders. Immature people react. Mature people respond. Are you a reactor or a responder? I'll give you an example. For some of you guys or gals who have teenagers, right? Or if you've parented teenagers, you know they want to get a reaction out of you. That's what they want to do. That's what some of your kids want to do. They want to get a reaction out of you. And they will tell you something. It can be the worst possible scenario. And you and they're just doing it to get a rise out of you. And so a mature parent understands this. And, may, and maybe they can not rise and react, but actually respond and say, oh, well, you know, that's interesting. And you can see that their level of wanting to rise you goes down with your response. But sometimes, what do we do? We explode. And I'm like, what are you thinking? What, how could you be doing that? Or what, 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 what's wrong with you, right? And we become reactors. And then they respond to that, and then we and we react to that, and it just becomes a nightmare because we're reactors instead of responders because we're driven by our flesh and not by the spirit. And just in case we're not getting the message that our tongue is something that we need to take seriously, and the words that come out of them, even any word that comes out of them, we need to take it seriously. Paul addresses it in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. What does he tell us to do? He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Well, what command did he just issue in Ephesians 29? 
Remember, context is key. What did he say? He said, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. In actuality, he said, let no unwholesome talk, let no unwholesome word proceed. And that word proceed is a present, is a present imperative with a negative, which means either stop doing it or don't begin doing it. So don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. So if you're doing it, stop it. If you haven't done it, don't do it. But only such a word that is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Ephesians chapter 4, 29, verse 30. So clearly, rotten words will grieve the Holy Spirit. This is a slippery slope, my friend. For when we grieve the Holy Spirit, we short-circuit the power to control our tongue because we're short-circuiting the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Rotten words need to be quickly confessed and repented lest the downward spiral begins. This is not some little matter that James is talking about here. Right? Right? The subject of tongue control brings to mind the radical trans transformation that we see in Peter. Think about Peter for a moment. I want you to think about Peter. Just so if those of you are feeling hopeless about your tongue control and you're feeling a little convicted, let's think about Peter. Before Pentecost, he was his, his open mouth was primarily he opened his mouth and exchanged the foot. Right? That's what he did. That was what Peter did. He was brash. He was always putting his foot in his mouth. He was always talking out of turn. And Jesus always had to correct them and had to rein him in. Well, after Pentecost, after receiving the gift of the Spirit, and I don't know if you've noticed this, and his power in Acts 1.8, Peter changed. He was supernaturally transformed. On one hand in the Gospels, he was an immature disciple. He often lost control of his tongue, and he had to be reproved or taught by Jesus. But after Pentecost, his spiritual discipline was evident by his controlled speech. Now possible because he was controlled by the Spirit. So it tells us that it is possible for us to become a perfect and mature believer by controlling our speech. Then James gives us some wonderful illustrations in verses 3 to 5. Verses 3 to 5, he gives us some wonderful illustrations. He says, if anyone does not stumble in word, he is perfect man, also able to bridle the whole body. That's two. Number three, indeed, verse three, indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole bodies. Right? Look also at a ship, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder, whatever the pilot desires. Why is he presenting these illustrations? Because he just said, for we, are, we all stumble in this area, but if we can control this, we can be perfect men. So basically, he is giving two very vivid, vivid uh, illustrations. Think of a horse. Think of a powerful horse, a powerful racehorse. And then you think of this thing being controlled by this little bit that goes in its mouth. And where does it go? Over its tongue. Over its tongue. So it holds its tongue down. But the rider is able to control this uncontrollable force. It's able to direct this energy. It is able to direct this animal by a little bit in his mouth. And it tells him to turn to the left and turn to the right. If we have the bit of the Holy Spirit pressed down on our tongue, It should be him that tells us to turn to the left and to the right and which words we speak and which words we don't. And then to bring it home, James talks about a boat. He talks about a ship. Now in the day, in James's day, a ship was directed by oars or it was directed by an oar in the back with someone 
that steered it so which direction they would go. If they didn't have that, the ship would be going wherever. It could it could crash, right? It could crash on the shore. It could be just drifted aimlessly by the wind. But the oars and the rudder and who controlled it, that gave it direction. So that the ship was able to get where it needed to go, just like the horse was able to get where it was to go because the the bit controlled it. So James is pointing out, when we live in submission to the Holy Spirit, he controls us. We are like a horse, a powerful horse who is racing in the race and it's winning the race because the bit controls us. The Holy Spirit controls us. We are like the ship who's not just floating about aimlessly in a storm and banging up against the shore. We are floating and sailing in the right direction and on course because the Holy Spirit is controlling this thing, this rudder, this, this tongue. So he's giving you a vivid illustration of what it would, it's like to have this Holy Spirit control us and what it's like to not. And he does that through the metaphor of the next one, which he says in verse 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. That phrase, boast great things, it's the only time you'll ever see it in the New Testament. It's the only time it's ever used. It means for me to, to bear oneself, lift oneself up, to be lofty and think high of yourself, right? And that's what our tongues naturally go to. It's the only time you'll see that phrase in, in the New Testament. So James is saying, just like that bridal can control that little that horse our tongue controls where our lives go right just like that little rudder so this is the other lesson he's teaching us that the rudder controls where the ship goes this tongue controls where we go it sets a course for us So we need to learn how to let the Holy Spirit be the bridle to control it and how to be for the Holy Spirit to be the pilot of the rudder. But then he moves on to talk about fire. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. How many of you have ever seen a forest fire? How many of you ever had the experience to be at a forest, a place where a fire has been in the forest. How many times have we seen forest fires on the news out west? How many times? We're all familiar with this. It only takes a little spark to get a fire going. It can be a harmless thing, but that spark, it could be the sun shining on a piece of glass, and in a matter of time, a whole forest is burnt. How is a tongue of fire? Well, let me tell you this. The book of Proverbs is filled with metaphor, metaphors of speech as tongues of fire. We see it in Proverbs 16, 27. A worthless man digs up evil while his words are like scorching fire. We can see it in Proverbs 26, 18 to 22, and you can read it on your own. So Proverbs 16, 27, Proverbs 26, 18 to 22. Someone once said, it is though all the wickedness in the whole world were wrapped up in this little piece of flesh. There are few sins people commit in which the tongue is not involved. Did you hear me? There are few sins that people, which people commit, which the, which the tongue is not involved. If you think James calls it the full range of iniquity, right? A very word of iniquity. What harsh words. James is saying that the full range of iniquity finds an outlet through our tongue. Think about that. It's virtually impossible to see with anger without expressing rage in our words, right? Bitterness comes out in our speech. It sours in our speech. Pride prattles on and on and on. Listen to me and how smart I am, right? Hate explodes from the lips. 
the tongue can suddenly turn uh, an otherwise gentle person into a monster. It is a world of iniquity. But isn't it interesting when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, they were tongues of fire that came down from heaven to enable the Christians to witness? But yet it's also possible for our tongue to be set on fire from hell. James has told us this. Remember, Jesus told us, it is not what enters into the mouth that defiles a man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles him. That's Matthew 15, 11. And here in James, when he talks about, when he uses the word defile, it is a significant, it, the tense that it uses is an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing pollution. It's an ongoing sickness. Whoa. Do not these pictures want to make you cry out to the Holy Spirit and pray Psalm 141.3? Right? We need to guard our tongues. We need to guard our tongues. When you hear gossip, pray silently in the spirit to keep your tongue busy, lest you join in the gossip. If I listen to gossip to put others down, I'm actually a, an accomplice in that fire that's being ignited from hell. Right? Listen to what James is telling you. Because you know what it tells us in John 8, 44, I believe, and I could be wrong about the reference. But it says that the devil is a father of lies and that he speaks lies and that, the, and that his words come from hell. If you are speaking lies, if you are speaking in the flesh, you are speaking as the devil speaks. It was the devil who spoke evil in the Garden of Eden. And when we speak evil, we are following in his footsteps. It means that the tongue becomes a tool of the devil to destroy individuals, to, to destroy churches. It, it, it can be through gossip. It can be through bitterness. It can be through heresy. It can be to tempt someone to sin. Our tongue always starts with sin. It's always a suggestion. Hey, you know what? You should meet up with this person. They're really good and they're really nice. Starts off with the tongue, right? Flames of hate, prejudice, slander, jealousy, all of those things. Envy, those are of the devil. They're of the devil. It's an uncontrolled tongue is a direct pipeline to hell. And it, and it burns filthy fires. But yet, it can also be an encouraging fire, the fire from heaven, the Holy Spirit fire. But it depends on who's in control of my heart. Is it my flesh or is it the Holy Spirit? Right? And we commit sin by lying, by gossiping, by adding fuel to the fire when we hear things about insinuations. We, we add fuel to the fire when we are critical in our words all the time. If we are constantly critical in our words, that can cause a fire and harm. We need to understand that there needs to be a balance between negative speak and positivity. We need to understand that for me to prattle on all the time and to constantly dominate the conversation, we need to understand that we need to have fewer words and let people, other people speak. We need to understand that idle words. We need to understand that Ephesians tells us, not let not on any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. That means swear words. That means cursing. That means, oh my God. That means all those things should not be coming from your mouth because you are no longer a child of Satan. You are a child of the king and your words need to match up to your spirit and to your heart. And some people are saying, this doesn't matter. I can just tell a little white lie and I can exaggerate my speech. And hey, it's okay if I say, you know, a swear word from time and time. Jesus will forgive me. 
Uh, I'll beg to differ that James is going to tell you right here that right now that one day you are going to stand before your God and he is going to call to mind every time. Every time you spoke when you should have been silent, you you swore when you should have, when you acted, you swore like a truck driver and you acted like someone in the world because out of the heart flows our words. And if we are speaking that way, that is showing that we do not have a transformed heart, that we do we are walking in the flesh and we are not walking in the spirit. Deadly poison. All of creation, if we look back to Genesis chapter 3, God created creation and he gave man control over the animals. The only thing we can't control is our tongue. We can see the wildest of animals trained, but we can't control our tongue. James is telling us here, from birth to the grave, the fire that burns in our mouth destroys unless it is controlled by the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on to tell us in verse 6, it says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it sets on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no one can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Let that sink in. It is an unruly evil. It is a deadly poison. I think James knows what a deadly snake is like. And I'm thinking he's thinking there's a few of those in his congregation. Think about the deadly poison. What is poison? It works secretly and slowly and it often kills. So think about that malicious person who's not happy with you because maybe you called them out on something or, you know, whatever. But they say something to someone else in hopes that it will keep going on and keep getting passed on and on and that it will cause some damage to you when you hear it. Or it'll just cause damage to you because it's a poison. They want to hurt you. Proverbs 18.21 tells us death and life are in the power of the tongue. I'm sure all of us can raise our hands and tell of a time when it was a deadly poison and it hurt us. And for some of us, we're still dealing with those things. Maybe it was words from our parents. Maybe it was words from a partner or a friend. There's that old saying, you know, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. But words will. And we carry them for a long time. I kind of believe in that vibration thing because some of us can recall word for word some of the things that hurt us. And we think it's the first stretch for God to hold us accountable for them. No. Deadly poison. An unruly evil. In Mark chapter 5, verse 9, we see a man possessed. And Jesus, Jesus uses that, uses that to give us an example that that is the same way we are when we do not control our tongue by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are like the evil possessed man. Mark 5, 9. You can read it later on your own time. If we bless our God and our Father, and with one time we are blessing God and our Father, and with it we're cursing man who have been made in the image of God. Right? Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. What does this remind you of? Well, in James chapter 1, we had the double minded man, didn't we? Well, right near, now we have the double tongued man, or what I like to call the forked tongue man. Or hypocrisy. How is he double tongued? How is she fork tongued? Well, one moment he's in church and he's blessing the Lord and he's praising the Lord and he's praying these long, flowy prayers. And then the next day he's out and he's cussing and he's swearing and he's tr 
gossiping and he's berating his wife and he's berating his children. That's what a double-minded person is. That is a double-tongued person. That is a that is a hypocritical person. One moment our our flesh, our tongue is under the control of the flesh, and the next moment it's under control of the Holy Spirit. And we keep flipping flopping. And we all have been there and we all have done it. We know this. We can be the double-tongued person. We I would be the first to raise my hand to say, I have been there, I have done that probably this week. Where one moment I'm in the flesh and the next moment I'm in the spirit because this is a battle. This is a warfare of the devil. This, the tongue, he knows can become from the fire of hell. But we don't have to live there. We don't have to live there. We can live and make sure and we can repent. And when the Holy Spirit convicts us and says, you spoke out of turn or you spoke incorrectly, we need to repent right away. And we need to ask for forgiveness to the people we've harmed with our words. Ecclesiastes tells us there's a time to speak and a time to be silent. And sometimes we give people a bucket load of Jesus and all they need is a thimble. We need to be asking the Holy Spirit, when do I speak? When do I be silent? What am I saying here? And James ends the chapter by asking us, he gives us these very vivid illustrations to show us how awful and how unruly and how much damage this little member can cause if we are not careful to make sure that we stay under the, the control of the Holy Spirit. But then he adds, he drives it home by asking us a couple questions. He's like, can a both salt water and fresh water come from a spring? What? And then he asks, can a fig tree bear olives and grapes, fruit, vines bear figs? Like he's asking a question for the help them to think about it. He's trying to explain to you that just as it is unnatural for salt and fresh water to come out of a river and a fig tree to bear grapes, it should be unnatural for you as a Holy Spirit filled Christian to speak cursing and blessing. It should be as unnatural to you to speak rudely and uh, demeaning to your family at home, but be all smiles and sweet stuff at, at, in the public places. Because Matthew chapter 12, 34 to 37, Jesus tells us that the indicator of our heart is our words. And we all know that when we are angry and hurt, we can spew bitter words. And if you are angry and you are bitter, you need to deal with the anger and bitter before the words come out. If you are angry and, and at your spouse right now, you need to go off to the bathroom. You need to pray for the Holy Spirit control and then come back and deal with the situation. You need to walk away. We need to examine our heart. Think of it as a fountain. What, what's coming out of your mouth? Are you coming, are your words spirit filled? Or are you walking in spirit filled water with fresh water that honors God? That honors people? Or are you are you spewing out salty water, which which is showing that you're not bringing your your members under control, that we are given up to our fallen sinful flesh, and we have a choice. We have a choice in how we respond every time to every situation, and we are one hundred percent responsible for every word that comes out of our mouth, every word. Every word. Jesus said, a good tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. He said that in Matthew 7, 18, and 20. He also said in Matthew 12, verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, 
or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. If I asked your family right now if your words would point to your faith, would they say yes or would they say no? It's one thing to get up here on D-Day and present words. It's one thing to get up in a pulpit and preach and present flowery words. But if I'm going home and I'm berating my husband, if I'm berating my kids, I will give an account to God for that. I will give an account to God for that. What's James' point? He is implying that if we are genuine believers, we should bring forth fruit or water, so to speak, that is cons consistent with our new birth and the new power of the indwelling spirit to produce good fruit and to produce fresh water. We don't talk like the world. We don't sound like the world. We are responders, not reactors. So I want you to write down this little, I want you to write down the word think. And you've probably heard of this acronym before, but I'm gonna give it to you again. Write it down, use this, the acronym THINK, and ask these questions every time before you speak. Is it true? Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? Before I speak, first thing I need to ask, five things. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? To rule your tongue, let Christ rule in your heart. I want you to pause a minute and I want you to think about your conversations that you had today. What were they like? What did you talk about today? What was the subject of most of your discussions? Was it all about you? Was it all about how you could make money? Was it all about how you could uh, succeed and you boasting about yourself? Do you talk too much and not give opportunities for others to speak? Do you tend to dominate conversations? Is your speech profitable to others? Are you constantly negative in your speech? Like you're constantly pointing out bad things, but you're not encouraging at all? And above all, do your words glorify God? Now that doesn't mean that we have to be all serious all the time, okay? Let's let's take a little breather here, okay? It doesn't mean that we have to be serious all the time. It doesn't mean that we can't have some fun. It just means that we don't partake of off-color talk. We don't we're not swearing like our, our neighbor across the street who says they're a non-believer, right? We're we're not partaking in gossip. We are not gonna tear down our, our brother and our sister. We're not going to do that. We're not going to partake in that. We're not going to spread that fire, right? I'm not going to to totally, you know, I, I want to I want to call this person out for what they're doing, but I need to take a break. I need to take a step back and say, is this what you want me to do, Holy Spirit? Is this the right time for me to do this, Holy Spirit? And are they ready to receive it? And if I say these things, are they what you want me to say? Right? We need to take this matter seriously. We do not guard our words. We have teeth and we have we have lips that protect our the words to come out of our mouth. But we need to set that guard. We need to pray that prayer in Psalm 141:3.
Psalm 39, 1 says, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. People should know by my speech to whom I belong and that I'm different. And Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, you do it, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Mind what you say, or you may say whatever comes to mind. Let's pray. Oh, Abba, I know that I have already repented many times today of the times this week where I have not exactly given thought to my words. I've been careless, and I've not heeded the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would help us as uh, men and women, whoever might be on this video tonight or watching this video, I pray that you would help us to understand how there is life and death in our words and that we would take this matter more seriously. And if we are a teacher, if we are a preacher, may we never, ever, ever approach any opportunity with careless disregard. Ever. And forgive us for the times that we have. Because when we approach this word, we are feeble men and women who barely know anything. And yet you use us to speak for you. And it's not us. It's all about the power of the Holy Spirit in us and through us. So I pray that you would help us to be men and women who are submitted and totally following the voice of the Holy Spirit. We ask you to forgive us and to help us. Help us to stay away from sins like deceit and lying, sins like um, spreading gossip, and even on social media, Lord, we have to understand that this is a problem area. We do not engage into vainless debates, right? We get to understand that this social media is also a place where we need to control our tongue. We need to be understanding about what careless speech is, and we can't make it a part of our lives. We have to assume that that carnal tongue is always going to want to come out and we need to be careful. So help us to refrain from that. We ask that you would set a watch over our lips. And, and we can be just like Ezekiel who said, you know, just sear it with a hot coal. Sear my tongue with a hot coal. So that I won't speak inappropriately and out of turn. So help us, Lord. Help us to control our tongue. Help us to use it for good. Help us to use it to glorify you. Help us to tell others about Jesus. Help us to help us encourage people, to encourage them on their journey, to encourage them on their walk. Help us to help our brother when they're down, but also help us to speak truth and love when the time is right and when it's necessary. This is about not, this is not a lesson about not talking and taking a vow of silence. This is about us using Holy Spirit wisdom and discernment and guidance in our words and in our speeches. Help us, I pray, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. For those of you who are biblical students and you want to learn something i'll tell you that i'm going to tell you a really good assignment for you this week that it might be something that you might want to consider in this lesson that we talk about and that is if you go through the book of proverbs the book of proverbs deals with um words are bad and are good words and go through the book of proverbs you can even do a google search or if you have like a commentary 
you can go through them and you go through all of the Proverbs about our good and our bad words and observe the wise words from Proverbs about how we use our words. And as you do, make a simple list of the positive and negative effects of words that we speak. And then ask the Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth and enable you to obey what you learned. And even as he transformed Peter, he can transform you from glory to glory into the image of, the, of Jesus, the living word. So go through the book of Proverbs. Look at what it says about our words and write it down, the positive and the negative. And then ask the Holy Spirit to be your teacher and to be your guide and to lead you into all truth. That's for you tonight. God bless you all. If you have, I'm so blessed to see you all tonight. I hope you will go ahead and you'll read the book of Proverbs. May God bless you. May God keep you as we go into this holy week, my friend. Please, please do not enter this week without thought. We are in the most holiest of holiest week. This is the week, the week for which we celebrate Christianity. It's the reason why we have Christianity. So may I encourage you to take some time to sit with your God and reflect on what this week, the events of this week. Go to church. Go to a Good Friday service. Go sit in a church and pray. Watch the Passion of the Christ. But do not treat this week as any other week. And that will help you understand the importance of why we need to control our tongue. Well, God bless you, everyone. And I hope that you have a great week. And just so you know, we will not have D-Day next Monday night, okay? I should have said this at the beginning. I'm sorry. But because it's Easter Monday and people are going to be with their family, we will come back the following Monday. So no D-Day next week, but we will have D-Day the following week. Okay, everybody under, understand. I will put that on social media so everybody sees it. But we're going to give you all a break so you can be with your family. And then we'll be back. I think it's the 25th. And uh, we'll be back. Okay, everyone. So have a great Easter. Spend some time with your family. Spend some time with your Lord and your Savior. And spend some time with your church community, okay, in this celebration. So God bless you and God keep you. And we'll see you on April 25th. 